Every Christmas, we partner together with local ministries and provide Christmas food baskets to families in need. This year, you can purchase, pack, and participate in giving baskets filled with food. Learn how you can be a part of a Christmas food basket by visiting your campus website for more details. Hey, good morning. Let's all stand together and worship. God the King, I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. Let's sing. We are a sea of voices. We are an ocean of your praise. Gathered under one name. We are a tide that's rising. And we cannot be contained. Gathered under one name, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing the glories of our Lord, God Almighty, oh, to sing the Savior's praise, the triumph of His grace, you are worthy, you are worthy. found our anthem at the cross where sin was slain gathered under one name where every chain is broken and every sorrow swept away yes lord gathered under one name oh, for a thousand times to sing the glories of our Lord, God Almighty, oh, to sing the Savior's praise, the triumph of His grace. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, God. With all heaven. With all heaven sing, and all earth belong, one holy King, one highest That's good. Lord. Sing that again. With all heaven. With all heaven sing, and all earth belong, one holy King, one highest throne. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. The glories of our Lord, God Almighty, oh, to sing the Savior's praise, the triumph of His grace, you are worthy, you are worthy, oh, for a thousand times to sing the glories of our Lord, God Almighty, oh, Sing the Savior's praise, the triumph of His grace. You are worthy. You are worthy. Sing, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, God. You are worthy. Amen. We're grateful to be in the house of the Lord together today, worshiping His name. Welcome to the church at Station Hill. If you're visiting with us today, 
Uh, you're our special guest. We're so grateful that you're here. And uh, we'd love to get some information from you and just uh, get to know how we can uh, know you better, serve you better. So there's a, a tear out card in your bulletin that you were handed when you came in. Uh, feel free to fill that out, turn it in during the offering or hand it to any of our staff as you're leaving today. But we'd so appreciate that. Uh, tonight, we've got a great time to gather together. Our family gathering is this evening at 530. Uh, great and exciting uh, updates about what the Lord is doing here at Station Hill and things that uh, are coming down the road and then the great combination of that and chili, okay? I know a lot of people are uncomfortable thinking about chili at 9.30 in the morning. But for the rest of us who are totally comfortable with that, I just want you to know it's gonna be great, all right? So if you're bringing food, bring it on at 5.15 and we'll start eating at 5.30. It'll be a great time together. Right now, why don't you shake a few hands around you? We'll continue to worship together. remain standing. Let's sing this great hymn together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus for my pardon this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing, this my plea yeah. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me wine and snow But the blood of Jesus. Sing that again, oh precious. Oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing it. This is all my hope. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus Sing, oh precious oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. One more time to the Lord. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's sing together. For every curse, you're the cure. For every sickness, you're the healer. For every storm, you're the calm. For all that's lost, oh, how to save your Sing that verse on that cross. On that cross of Calvary, every burden has been defeated, every wretched heart redeemed. You drown our sins in seas of crimson. And hallelujah, death is beaten. Christ has risen from the grave. Hallelujah, it is finished all to you. The highest grave. On that day of utmost glory, Every shackle will come undone, my solid rock, my Sing that every shackle and every shackle will come undone, my solid rock, thine is the kingdom, hallelujah, death is beaten, Christ has risen. From the grave, hallelujah, it is finished all to you, the highest praise, hallelujah, death is beaten, Christ has risen from the grave, hallelujah, now and forever. Your grace runs deeper for all enslaved. The ransom paid, light of the world. Yours is Sing the that. Where power. Where there was sin, where there was sin, your love rushed in. Where sin runs deep, your grace runs deeper for all enslaved. The ransom. is the power hallelujah death is beaten Christ has risen from the grave hallelujah it is finished all to you the highest praise hallelujah Death is beaten, Christ has risen from the grave. Hallelujah, now and forever, all to you, the highest praise, all to you, all to you, the highest praise, all to you.
every burden has been defeated, every wretched heart redeemed. You drown our sins in seas of crimson. Yes, Lord. God, we praise you. May be seated. You're here today because that's true for you. I hope you're here because you believe that the gospel changes everything and that has happened in your life. But I know that some of you may be here and the gospel hasn't changed everything in your life yet. You're still searching. You're still looking. You're looking for peace. And here we believe that Jesus is the only answer to what you're looking for. He's the only way that you can be reconciled to God. 
And we know that, but there are millions of people across the planet that don't know that, that have never heard that. They have no idea that God's made a way for their salvation. And so every month here at Station Hill, we're praying for a different unreached people group somewhere in the world. And so we say that a a group is unreached if less than 2% of the people that identify in that group, if less than 2% of those people have chosen to follow Christ. And so this month we are praying for Somalis, praying for the people of Somalia. Um, I don't know how much you know about Somalia, but I would encourage you to do just a little research. And when you do, you'll find out that to be a Christian in Somalia is to basically sign your own death sentence. It is complete and total persecution of Christians in this nation to the point that when you look it up statistically to see how many people claim to be evangelical Christians in Somalia, the number is 0.00%. It's so few that you have to go out to further decimals. And so I was speaking with someone this week who works for an organization. It's a global organization. They're literally in every single country across the world, except for North Korea. But they're in every country across the world working and training up people to teach the gospel to others. And he told me that in the region of Africa, in that central eastern region of Africa where Somalia is located, over this past year, they have raised up and trained over 10,000 people to share the gospel. And out of that 10,000 people in, in that eastern region of Africa, one person is working in Somalia. One to reach millions of people. And this man gets up every day and he goes about his business sharing the gospel of Christ, knowing that if he's caught, he could be tortured, imprisoned, put to death. He knows every day could be his last day. And yet the gospel has changed everything for him. And he's willing to give his life for that. As I heard that story, it made me think of Paul and what he wrote in his letter to the Philippians. And he said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I just wonder, do any of us take our faith? as seriously as this man in Somalia. And it's convicted me this week. And so I just ask that we would pray today. This is our prayer and altar time and we have a few moments to be silent before the Lord. But I ask you to cry out to the Lord in this time for the people of Somalia who, if no one tells them about Jesus, how could they ever know? what he's done for them. And so I ask that you pray for this one lone worker who is getting up courageously every day and doing what he can to tell people about Jesus. Our pastor will be coming forward. You can come and pray for him. This altar is open to you, but let's take some time right now to pray. And don't forget the people of Somalia.
Lord, we know that you see all things and your eyes are never off of your children. So God, we pray for those that you are calling to salvation in Somalia, Lord. How can they hear unless someone shares with them? And how can people share, Lord, unless they're called and unless they go? So we pray that you would raise up workers like this one man that would be bold, that would be willing to risk everything for the sake of making your name known. And God, we pray for him. We pray that even now he feels the prayers of your people, God, that he would be emboldened to continue to do what he does. God, we pray for supernatural protection over him, that you would blind eyes that need to be blinded and close ears that need to be closed to what he's doing, God, but that you would open eyes and open ears of those that you are calling to be saved. I know there are people in this room right now, Lord, their eyes are closed to the truth of the gospel. God, I pray that today would be the day that you would remove those blinders, Lord. Let today be the day of their salvation. I pray for our pastor as he comes forward to give his message, God, just speak through him. Give him the words that you have for us today, God. Help us to hear and believe with all of our hearts. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Thank you, Leanne, and thank you, choir and worship team. Well, happy early Thanksgiving to you as uh, I see several guests and I know some families already arrived in town uh, for the big holiday this upcoming week. Uh, But it has begun, right? The all out assault, commercials, right? Mailboxes, here it comes. Uh, the Christmas commercialism blitz. And so I wanna encourage you to do something. Today on your way in, you were handed this guide, Hope for the World, our service guide, Christmas 2017. Take that and put that on top of your stack, right? Of catalogs uh, when you get home today. Uh, What our missions team does as they have intentionally, uh, we talk about a lot of the partners and the stories that we have. And I know sometimes when it comes to this time of year and you think, how can I give my first fruits, right? Of the holiday season to Christ? How can I use our time and our money and our effort? How can we point people to Jesus during a season in which a lot of hearts are amazingly softened and open and receptive to him? Well, these are some of the ways. Uh, If you take a look at this guide, you'll see it lists some of our uh, partners that are here in Middle Tennessee. We specifically highlighted those this year, uh, and we've asked them to give us specific opportunities that you could be involved with. Uh, So as you carefully read and pray through this as a family, we encourage you to reach out and get connected with one of these local partners. If you'll turn with me to page 10, uh, you'll see this big ad for Christmas food baskets. And this is a key emphasis here at our campus, the church at Station Hill, working with our local partner, The Well. uh, We help provide food for needy families uh, during this holiday season. Uh, So on Saturday, uh, December the 9th, uh, we'll be gathering together uh, to pack those uh, boxes in the morning. This is a great family mission opportunity for you and your kids and your grandkids. Uh, And so you can sign up to do that so we can know that you're coming. Uh, We also have some people that we ask to help distribute those. uh, And then definitely we need some more people to help purchase those uh, for families that are in need. So Lee Harrison, after the services today, is going to be out in the atrium uh, at the missions table. uh, And you can find him and you can sign up. Purchase, pack, participate. Uh, All of those elements are important because this is one of the ways that we meet tangible needs in our community uh, to open up doors to sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. You also see, if you flip just a page over, our Hope for the World mission offering goal this year for our campus, $75,000. None of that will stay with us. It will all go uh, to these three mission partners that you see listed there. Uh, There's a list of our missionaries so that you can know who to pray for there uh, in the back. And there are some great facts just about the ways that God is using you um, and the way that you serve and the way that you give uh, each and every week uh, because there is gospel need all year long. But we know that this year, uh, this can be a catalyst for you. So take this home, pray through it, talk about it with your family uh, and consider how you would point people uh, to the hope that we just sang about because we really do believe that the gospel changes everything. So let's point people to Jesus together this holiday season. Will you join me as we pray as our ushers come forward? Heavenly Father, we are a grateful people. This week of all weeks, 
we're called to stop and count our blessings, to name them one by one, to remember all that you have done. And so, Father, when we stop for a moment, it helps us to recalibrate our hearts when we give thanks. It helps us not to be a greedy or people uh, who just are hungry for more and more and more to consume more and more of what our culture has to offer. Instead, we're mindful that you gave everything, that you didn't hold anything back for us in sending your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray that just as you are always faithful to us, that we will be faithful to you, that we will put you first and always during this season and all others as we look for tangible ways to use what you've entrusted to us to point people to the gospel and the hope of Jesus Christ. So, Father, use these tithes and offerings. Multiply them so that your name will become increasingly famous among all people groups of the world until everyone knows and has the opportunity to respond to the gospel of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as the ushers are coming by, uh, I want to just reiterate Cliff's invitation to join us tonight for a family gathering. Uh, it's a special time as a church family. And so we're looking forward to seeing you at 530 for chili supper. And then uh, following, we'll move in here. You'll hear some incredible things that God's doing through our mission partners. Uh, here's some reports from our teams. Uh, we've got some very exciting things to share with you about what God's doing at our campus and beyond. Uh, and, uh, and so it's just an exciting time to get to be a part of our church. And we hope that you can make it back uh, and join us tonight. All right, you have your pencils ready because everybody is going to gather around the Thanksgiving table and every one of you is looking for a good joke to tell, right? So I want to share with you a joke that you can tell at the Thanksgiving dinner table, right? Uh, I heard this one first serving in Alabama, my first full-time ministry position for four years. So I'm simply telling you the joke the way it was told to me. All right. So you have an Alabama football fan who walks into a bar. Yeah, that's right. We're starting with a bar joke, right? Baptist preacher. Here we go. He walks into a bar. He sits next to a man and he says, hey, you want to hear a joke about some Auburn fans? And the guy says, well, let me tell you something. I'm six foot, 220 pounds, and I happen to be an Auburn fan. Said so the guy sitting next to me, he's 6'2", 240. He's an Auburn fan. The guy on the other side of him, 6'8", 300 pounds, and he's an Auburn fan too. You still want to tell that joke? And the Alabama fan says, Ah, no, I wouldn't want to have to explain it three times. <laughs> I love it because there's like two waves, right? The people who get it first and then, Oh, I get it now, right? See, you'll be the head of the Thanksgiving dinner table if you tell that one right there. And here's the beauty of that joke, right? You can flip it around, Auburn fan, Alabama fans, right? Kentucky, Georgia, Tennessee, whatever your favorite team is. Baptist, Methodist, right? You, you can go boomer, millennial. You can go a hundred different directions. Why? Because we all have these categories in our mind, don't we? We all have these boxes into which we place people. And it's funny until it's not. It's funny until we realize that those categories, those boxes that we place people in in our culture and in our society often present barriers to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so one of the most amazing things to me about the ministry of Jesus is that he totally obliterated all of those boxes. The only category he cared about was healthy or sick, lost saved. And so we're going to read the story of the calling of Matthew Levi as we conclude our engaged series today. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from Luke chapter five, verses 27 through 32. After this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Then Levi hosted a grand banquet for him at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were guests with them. But the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus replied to them, the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners 
to repentance. The healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Oh, Heavenly Father, we live in a divided world that seems to grow more so every day. People looking for love and acceptance huddle down in their little subculture. Oh, Father, would you help us to see people not in their boxes or categories, but would you help us to see with the eyes of Jesus that there are sick people in this world, they are soul sick. The waters that they're drinking from are polluted. What they need is living water. What they need is to be set free. What they need is hope that only comes through your gospel. And so, Father, we have an awesome calling. Would you make us wholly aware of that calling today? Would you help us to live like Jesus? And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated this morning. And so for a moment, I want you to think in your mind, about the person or the category of people that in your mind's eye would be the last people that you would ever see saved. I want you to think about the person or the group of people that to you that is so far from the gospel, maybe even a group of people that when their name or their image or the thought about them comes up, you just kind of uh, inside a little bit. What would it take for them to come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ? Because Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, would have been in a category of people that in their time, the religious people would have said, there's no way that guy can come into a right relationship with God. And so Luke gives us this beautiful story in these three very simple acts. We're going to walk through them today and then we're gonna talk about the implications for us as individuals, as families, and as a church family and what God calls us to do as disciples who seek to make disciples of Jesus. And so act number one, scene number one for us today is this, the call. The call, two words, follow me. Follow me. It was a radical call and it was a radical response by Matthew Levi, right? To leave everything and follow him. And so it's interesting when we begin to spend time in Luke's gospel that we realize that Luke was the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. And as such, he had a particular passion for the aspect of the ministry of Jesus inspired by the Holy Spirit to remind us that Jesus was for the whole world. Flip back in your Bibles a page to Luke 3, 6, and you'll see a summary of the mission statement of Jesus, right? As voiced through the words of Isaiah quoted here, and everyone will see the salvation of God. And everyone, meaning the whole world, will see the salvation of God. And so the Gospel of Luke has the most stories that we have in the Gospels about Jesus engaging with outcasts, with outsiders, with those who felt like they were outside the system, so to speak. And Matthew Levi certainly would have been one of those people. Why were tax collectors so hated in that era? Well, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, it's obvious. Nobody likes the tax man, right? None of us have an abiding affection for the IRS in our hearts because it's taxes. It's uncomfortable. It's something that we have to do, but none of us like it very much. And so he was a tax man. But in particular, during that era of history, the Roman Empire, to keep an empire, had to raise an army. They had to build roads. They had to be sure communication took place. And so that cost money. There were regional leaders as well, guys like Herod and his sons that we read about in the Bible who had to keep control. And then not only that, they would allow the local tax collector to take his cut as well. And so the doors were wide open for corruption. So a lot of these guys were known as cheaters and as stealers. And so uh, they, the people didn't like them very much. But the other aspect for the Jewish people was that the Roman Empire was a symbol of Gentile oppression. 
And so if God's people were going to be free, well, they had to overthrow the hated Romans. And so because of that, they declared those who affiliated with the Romans to be ceremonially unclean. And so tax collectors were outsiders in every way. You didn't associate with them if you were a good Jew. And yet here is Jesus literally going to a tax collector in his booth. They would set up booths along the highway, just like there are toll booths today. And he addresses one of these tax collectors and says two words, follow me. Notice what Matthew Levi did. He left everything and he followed Jesus. It's amazing that the word of Jesus is so powerful that it creates life change. And so Matthew, compelled by this incredible teacher, miracle worker, healer, realizes that this is an invitation that cannot be missed. So he gets up, he leaves his prophets, he leaves his profession, he leaves his personal identity, all of that behind in order to follow Jesus. And so the call is powerful and it's effectual. Not only that, of course, we know that Matthew Levi goes on to become one of Jesus's 12. He was calling him to radical discipleship. And when you begin to think about the collection of characters that Jesus assembled, right? It included people like Zealot, who were zealots, who were uh, violent, uh, violently opposed to Roman rule, including people like Matthew Levi, who were tax collectors, who colluded with the Romans. You begin to realize what a unique cast of characters that Jesus brought together to symbolize in this new little community, the future new community of his people. But the call went out and Matthew responded and that led to scene number two, act number two in this little story. The crowd of people that gathered to meet Jesus who were all outsiders in one way or another. The text says tax collectors and others. Later we see, later we see the Pharisees call them uh, tax collectors and sinners. All right, it wasn't a moral judgment necessarily, but it was a category of people who were outside the law, outside the boundaries of Judaism. And these people came together. And here's one of the most fascinating things about new converts. Do you realize they have more opportunity to reach the lost in the first couple of years after getting saved than at any other time in their life? Why? because they were friends with people who were lost. And as a person becomes a disciple of Jesus, often their lifestyle and behavior changes. Therefore, their circles of friends change. And so true then, true now. There is an opportunity when a first person first comes to Jesus for them to let their friends know who Jesus is. And that's exactly what Matthew does. The money that he once used on himself or hoarded to himself, he now uses to throw a lavish banquet. There's a lot of parties around Jesus, especially in the gospel of Luke, because people were always wanting their friends to meet them. If you think about it, there was a little subculture here within Judaism in this little town of Capernaum on the north of the Sea of Galilee. There was this network of tax collectors. They only had each other as friends, right? Because everyone else rejected them. And so they formed this little subculture. And you see this happening in our culture today. People's career, their profession, often their lifestyle will lead them to huddle in these little subcultures. And in that subculture, there's often a gatekeeper, someone who's influential in that group, someone when they, when they issue the invitation to a party, they all show up. And apparently Matthew had this kind of influence because he issues this party and they all show up to meet this Jesus. And then as now, table manners were incredibly important. And so table customs of the day were that who you ate with, you associated with. There was some level of friendship and connection that was there. Tonight, we will gather together to, as Cliff told you earlier, eat chili as a church family, right? We love, especially in our tradition, to call that fellowship because we like excuses to hang out and to eat with one another. But one of the things that you'll notice in the New Testament is that table fellowship, table culture is incredibly important. It's why Paul repeatedly told them to gather together and to not show favoritism, right? And who sat where? It's because this was a unifying element of their culture at the time. It was incredibly important. And so to kind of play off an old saying, anyone who said that Baptists don't gamble has never had to choose between 20 crockpots full of chili at a family gathering, right? 
When you gather people together around a common meal, it means that there is shared relationship, that there is shared life. There's an old ancient proverb that says, I saw him eating and I knew who he was. Because who they were affiliating with, what they were eating, how they were eating, these are all realities. I've traveled on mission journeys and been in other countries, and it's fascinating sometimes. And as the pastor, sometimes I get invited, you know, and they, they offer me like the ceremonial dish. One time in Nepal, it was goat eyeball and goat ears, right? It was a tough moment for me because this was the honored meal. And do I eat or do I pass? I passed, so I didn't pass out, amen? That's what I did in that moment, so I respectfully declined. But table customs and manners were important then, they're important now, and this was a sign that Jesus reached out irregardless of boxes, irregardless of categories in society, and that he validated people for who they were. Not for what they did, but for who they were. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But of course, that evoked a response. And so act three for us is this, the complaint. Why comes from the Pharisees and scribes. Notice, by the way, who they were talking to in this moment. They didn't have the guts to talk to Jesus. And so it says the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now, let me explain this for a moment, because if you were a, quote, good religious person in the first century, you would have been trained to think in this way. They believed in something called salvation by separation is a way we might summarize it. In order to stay holy as God's people, I have to distance myself from all of the unholy people and all of the unholy things that they do. And so for us to stay ceremonially clean and pure and to honor the Old Testament, right, as they had it, then we have to distance ourselves from those people. So in their mind, there was this conundrum. Because you have Jesus, a Jew, who's powerful in his teaching and in his healing ministry, and yet he does things that good Jews don't do, like eating meals with tax collectors and sinners. You see, Jesus came to change everything, as the choir just sang. And this is one of the things that was changing with the coming of his kingdom. It was no longer salvation by isolation, but his people, his disciples were to carry the gospel to people. He prayed in John 17 for his followers to be in the world, but not of the world. And that's an important distinction. So I want us to slow down here for a minute and I want us to think about this carefully because if we're going to be equipped to be disciples, we need to understand this principle thoroughly. And so I want to put up a graphic on the screen that'll help explain it, I hope. When, you guys know I like mountain hiking, so I'm gonna use this as a metaphor, right? When we are going and moving people towards gospel transformation, we can fall into a ditch or fall off the cliff on either side of the mountain here. On one hand, like the Pharisees, we can move towards cultural excessive separation. Will we remove ourselves from the very people who need the hope of Christ? that we get in our churches and in our little holy huddles and we put up the walls real high and we just say, we're just gonna hang on till Jesus comes first or I die and go to heaven, whichever happens, and that's fine for me. The problem with that is Jesus commanded us as his disciples to be disciple makers, to go. So we can't fall into that ditch any longer in the new covenant. On the other side of the equation, we can fall off the mountain in the area of cultural conformity. In an attempt to relate to people, we become just like them. We watch what they watch. We eat what they eat. We go to the places they go. And we lose all distinctiveness when it comes to being a follower of Jesus. I'll tell you a story from my early days being a youth pastor. There was another youth pastor in our community who got caught smoking marijuana. And his defense to me, literally, when I talked to him about it was, well, I had to be able to relate to my teenagers who smoke marijuana, right? I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I, he didn't last long in ministry, right? Okay. Because he was excessively conforming and using that as an excuse. The proper balance for us is found in passages like Ephesians 5, verse 7 through 11. Turn there with me in your Bibles for a moment. Because we need to understand this. If we're going to properly engage those around us. That we go to them with the love of Jesus. 
But we are called to be the influencers, not the influenced. Look what it says in verse 7. Therefore, do not become partners with the disobedient. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light results in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, discerning what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. That that's what we're called to do by the very light that we bring to the darkness. So understand the principle here. Jesus would certainly have a meal with tax collectors and sinners, but in doing so, he was validating who they were, not their behavior and what they did. And that's such an important distinction for us to draw because we have to be careful that we calibrate ourselves to live and proclaim the gospel so that it impacts others' lives, not so that we are dragged down into the behavior and the influence of our world. And so what is Jesus' response to the question, which this is fascinating to me, right? The Pharisees ask the question to the disciples, but Jesus is clearly in the room and can hear them, right? I hear you, I hear you talking about me right in front of me to my disciples, but indirectly. So let me address you directly. And what does Jesus say in verse 31? Jesus replied to them, the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. The healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. When I was reading that passage, my mind immediately flashed to a story. You're probably familiar with the story. You may not remember the name, Kent Brantley. The story is he is the doctor who is responsible for the response from Samaritan's Purse in their hospital to the Ebola crisis in West Africa in 2014. And I found a quote from him. I want to put it on the screen for you because what he says is powerful. He says, medicine is a way of loving our neighbor. So why was he there? Why would he put himself at risk in the middle of an international health crisis? Why would he be there? And if you remember the story, he contracted Ebola himself because he was following the command of Jesus to love our neighbor as ourselves. And for him as a doctor, as a, as a missionary doctor, medicine is a way of loving our neighbor. And so as he contracted the disease to the grace of God, he gave God all the credit. He was administered an experimental drug. He was flown back to the United States, the first person with Ebola ever on our, on our continent. And so he was treated and he successfully recovered and walked out of that hospital in Atlanta, Georgia, giving all the glory to God. And he went on to say this when he was interviewed about why he did it. I think that when there's a crisis, God wants us to be there. He doesn't want us to run away. He's put us there for a reason and he expects us to do something about it. You see, that's a perfect picture of what Jesus was describing, right? If you're a doctor and you have this training and this knowledge, but you remove yourself from the patients who are sick, then you're no good to anybody. But when you put yourself in the line of risk, when you go to them to help them in the name of Jesus, to love them as a neighbor, then there's risk, but there's also great opportunity. And so Jesus in this moment says, his followers are going to be the people who go to the sick, who find themselves in the hard places, in the difficult situations. Why? Because that's what Jesus commanded and called us to do. He goes on to say, it's not the righteous that need healed, right? Translation paraphrase, it's not those who think they are righteous that I came for, but the sinners who are in need of repentance. And underline or highlight that last word because it often gets lost when we talk about this passage. You see, Jesus came to meet anybody where they were at, but he did not leave them there. When he transformed them, they changed. Repentance means a change of mind. It means turning around and going the other direction. So yes, we wanna meet people where they are at, but we want to see their lives transformed and changed because of the power of the gospel. And such was the story of Matthew Levi. So some takeaways for us today as we consider how we engage people the way that Jesus did. We're gonna have some fun with this anybody word, right? Takeaway number one, Jesus saw everybody as a somebody 
who matters to God. Psalm 139, Jesus, as the creator, knew that every person had dignity and worth, that they were fearfully and wonderfully made. And we live in a world today in which many people don't even know the value of their own existence because it's never been affirmed. It's never been affirmed by anyone around them. And so Jesus knew that. And when he treated people as people, not you're in this box so I can't talk to you, not you're in this category so I won't have a meal with you or dinner with you. When Jesus treated people with love and respect and dignity as people, he was respecting them and the fact that they were created in the imago dei, in the image of God, just like you are. And it's why I love Luke 9, 11. I mentioned this verse earlier in the series where it says that Jesus welcomed people. He created time and capacity in his life to welcome people in. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God. So he gave them the message and he healed those who needed healing. So he ministered to their needs. Jesus did both. And in doing so, brought together the very essence of what it means to be human, to care for people, to speak the truth to them, to help meet their needs. And when you do that well to those who are around you, it speaks volumes and it's life transforming when the Holy Spirit at work in you recognizes the opportunity that the Holy Spirit is creating in the needy life of another person, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, whatever it is. But when we step into that gap as followers of Jesus and we treat everybody as a somebody who matters to God, it changes lives. Takeaway number two for us is this. Nobodies respond when anybody treats them as a somebody. People who feel like they're nobodies, they respond when anybody treats them like a somebody. Y'all, sometimes we wonder how people get lured into unhealthy relationships Sometimes we wonder how people end up in a cult and they get trapped in it. This is the reason why. Because they feel like nobody cares about them. And so when someone comes along and promises them inclusion, that you can be a part of our thing, that we want you on our side, even if it's polluted, even if it's unhealthy, even if it's unhealthy to them, they get to the point they don't care anymore. All they want to do is to be loved and accepted. This isn't the only story about a tax collector who's transformed by Jesus in the gospel of Luke. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke 19. We see the story there of a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. And he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in that tree and he said... Okay, some of you are awake. Yeah, right, Zacchaeus, you come down for what? That's right, because I'm going to your house today. Why? To share a meal with you. Here's Jesus, Luke 19, on his way to the cross. I think he had a thing or two on his mind in that moment, right? And yet, as he's walking through Jericho, he spots the tax collector, the outsider. And the same theme repeats itself again. Jesus shows him dignity, worth, value. He goes to eat with him. Zacchaeus is transformed. He not only gives back what he has stolen, he gives back and then some. And then we see this beautiful summary statement of the ministry of Jesus, right? In Luke 19, 10. He came to what? Seek and save that which was lost. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Lost. So wherever it's lost, Jesus and his disciples are going after it. And nobodies, people who feel like they've been forgotten by our culture, forgotten by our world, they respond when anybody treats them as a somebody. And that leads us to take away number three for us. And this is such an important reminder for us who are in the church. People who think they're somebodies often treat others like nobodies. We have to be humble. We have to remember how far Christ has brought us because there's yet another story in Luke about the Pharisees grumbling and complaining. You'll find it in chapter 15. Matter of fact, it's the setup to three very important parables that Jesus tells in rapid fire succession. Again, the Pharisees complaining to the disciples. Again, Jesus in earshot hears them. 
and rattles off not one, not two, but three of the most powerful stories ever told about what matters to God. This parable of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the parable of the lost son. You know it as the story of the prodigal son. And we all love the story because you have the rebellious son. And we all see a little bit of ourselves in him, right? That we want it our way. So when he, in essence, tells the father, I'd rather you be dead. I just want your money. And so in a shocking turn of events, the patriarch divides up his money like he's already dead. He gives it to the son. He goes off. He lives lavishly. He blows it. He finds himself in a pig stall, wishing he could eat what the pigs eat. And then I love the beauty of this phrase, when he came to his senses, right? That's what I pray for prodigals. Lord, would you bring them to their senses? It would be better for me to be home with the father, living like one of his slaves or servants than living like this. So defeated, he decides to head home. And when he does, something shocking happens. There is the father who this whole time, for months and years, has been watching and praying and waiting for his rebellious son to come home. And as soon as he spots him, he does what no patriarch in the ancient world would have ever done. He hikes up his toga, right? And he runs and he embraces him and he weeps and he puts his own robe on him and he calls out his servants and he says, we're gonna throw a party for my son. He was lost, but now he's found. And for many of us, that story so moves our hearts because we have played the rebel at one time that we just can't believe how good God's grace is, but we stop right there. And that's not really the point of the story. Because you see, for every person who tries to do it their own way rebelliously, there are those who try to be rule followers. And the story goes on to talk about the older brother who's the rule follower, who is trying to find and forge his own way into getting the father's stuff, but by following the rules, not playing the rebel. And in this story, he is upset that the father is making such a big deal about the younger son. And so what does he do? He refuses to go into the party. He stands outside saying, I followed all the rules. I did what I was supposed to. And the father comes out to beseech him, to beckon him, to join the party as well. Because the father loves him. And the story ends with the cliffhanger. Will the older brother enter the party? Or will he stay on the outside judging and looking in? And the reason why Jesus told that parable is because when we think we're somebody, our temptation, right, is to try to manipulate God in our own way by being the rule follower, by being the good person, and in doing so, earn our own way into right standing with God. You see, the beauty of that story is no matter what box you're in, younger brother, older brother, tax collector, Pharisee, Jesus came to say, whatever way you're trying to do it on your own, it's all wrong. The only way is me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father except through me. And so it's a humbling reminder to us that we can't be like the Pharisees standing on the outside, acting like somebody's and treating people who are lost and hurting like they're nobodies. It's convicting and it's challenging. And so there is a way that we can frame our personal mission in the old language of the gospel song. I want to put it up on the screen for you. This is what our mission should be. I'm a nobody, okay? Not meaning that you're not of worth, that's not what that means, but what it means is what's important is not me, but the Christ that is in me. I'm a nobody telling everybody about a somebody who can save anybody. That should be the cry of our hearts. And as we, as a church, Consider the ways that God has enabled us, the Spirit has led us to engage people. You're going to encounter some of them this week. They're family members, and they're gonna be seated around the dinner table. They're neighbors. You have a little extra time off work to rake the leaves, to get outside, to do whatever. You're gonna encounter these neighbors who are home, and they have never been told and shown the love of Jesus Christ. So this is our mission to simply tell everybody about the somebody, capital S, who can save anybody. 
and we have a mission as a church. In just a few weeks, we're going to vote on what we've been unpacking these last five weeks to officially embrace this as the mission statement of our church as we engage the future. It's about what we do to engage the whole person with the whole gospel. Jesus went to Matthew Levi. He called him. The whole person, it changed everything in Matthew Levi's life. He engaged him with the whole gospel, that that's the answer that we truly need. And we must be equipped to do that anywhere, anytime, and with anybody, regardless of the box or the category that our culture puts them in. So will you stand with me this morning as we affirm this statement together as God's people, that our mission as a disciple-making church is to call people into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ as we engage the whole person with the whole gospel, anywhere, anytime, with anybody. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for Jesus. When we slow down to pay attention to the rhythms of his life, we realize how countercultural he truly was to embrace those on the fringes and outskirts of society, to reach out to those that the establishment would say that person could never be saved. Oh, Father, that we would see the way that Jesus sees, that we would go the way that Jesus called us to go, and that, Father, we would be light in a dark world as we extend the call for sinners just like us, to come home. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Sing this great hymn with us this morning in response. We'll sing together. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. On the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary. call today through his word. The gospel reminds us that it's worse than we ever thought it could be. That lost in our sin, trapped in our box, we have no hope of getting out by ourselves. Rebellion or keeping the rules, it doesn't matter which route we take. We can't do it on our own. So that also means this, that the good news of Jesus is better than you ever imagined or dared to hope because he's come for you. 
and he's calling you home today. So if you need to respond to the good news of the gospel, that's why we're here. I'm gonna be down front in just a moment. Our decision counselors are coming now. They're gonna be to my right and my left. So there are plenty of people for you to talk with and pray with as you respond to the work that the word is doing in your heart this morning. Maybe for you today, you've been convicted that you've got a particular person in mind, a friend, a neighbor, a family member, someone that you need to engage that whole person with the whole gospel. We'd love to pray with you, talk with you about that. Maybe you feel convicted that you need to join this church and lock arms with brothers and sisters who are going to be about this mission, sharing Jesus anywhere, anytime with anybody. Brian, Brandon, some of our team are in the back. They love to connect with you. And tonight we're gonna be talking about more about some of those opportunities that God's placing in front of us to do that. We hope that you can come back and join us. But this morning, would you respond to the calling of Jesus? Because we're to be a people who engage the whole world with the whole gospel. So you are loved and you are sent. Have a great holiday week.